Welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast. I'm Sylvie Legere. I am uh, the host. And with me today, I have Megan Cummings Hansen. Hi, Megan. Hi, Welcome. Sylvie. How are you? Great. Welcome to the podcast. And the focus of our podcast is really an informed podcast. It is an audio version of a policy circle brief on campaign finance. Our purpose today is to walk you through, provide an audio version of this brief, and also some uh, discussions around each section of the brief. So I'll start with introducing Megan, and then we'll be going through this very interesting brief, very informative brief on campaign finance. Um, so Megan is the Vice President of Political Affairs at a Detroit-based Rock Central, a professional services company that supports Rocket Mortgage, Quicken Loans, and the Rocket family of companies. So in that role, uh, you lead the Rock Central's political strategy, fundraising at the federal, state, and local levels. And Megan, you also lead the company's federal government affairs team, advocating for Rocket Company's legislative priorities in, in Congress. You spent your whole career in uh, in fundraising from very different angles. Uh, one working with Bellwether Consulting Group, a political fundraising firm, and you also served as the finance director for the NRCC. And and you worked many years at the NRCC in various capacities. Um, you are a Washington D.C. native and a graduate of the University of Richmond, and you live in D.C. So welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast, Megan, and thank you you for taking the time to to do this with me. Thank you for having me. Uh, so we'll start, you know, with kind of introducing uh, this brief. We'll just, um, you know, th this brief, I'll just restate that. Uh, so, so this brief really dives into the basics of campaign finance and specifically the key terminology and debate surrounding campaign spending, the types of political organization that raise and spend money in the political process, and a little bit on this law and court cases that have shaped uh, campaign finance and helpful information for you to know before you donate and actually become really interested in participating as a donor uh, in political campaigns. So, you know, as an introduction, the main purpose of campaign spending uh, are to generate name recognition, reach potential voters with a candidate's message, and like any enterprise, political campaigns need resources to fund the activities that will help get the candidate elected. And the amounts vary greatly depending on the type of race, whether the race is contested, whether it's national, state, local, and the cost of media in the, in the market. So we, at the Policy Circle, there's a series around the election. There's one on election integrity. There's also an active voter guide, and we invite you to also review these briefs and use it as the cornerstone of your Policy Circle discussion. So one section of the brief always goes into why it matters. And Megan, I'd like to invite you to kind of tell us, read about free speech and how campaign finance and contributing to, uh, to a campaign is really an, a form of free speech. Maybe you could read that section. Read that section? Sure. So um, money is spent, is spent differently depending on the type of organization, the activities they are allowed to engage in, and any relevant laws. Hard money goes directly to candidates and is tightly limited by campaign finance laws. The limitations make it hard to raise, but few restrictions make it easy to spend. Soft money cannot go directly to a candidate or campaign and can only be used for party building activities, such as advocating for the passage of a law and voter registration, and not for advocating a particular candidate in election. However, contributions can be unlimited. The Institute for Free Speech notes foreign nationals, national banks, and congressionally chartered corporations like Fannie Mae may not make contributions in any election, federal, state, or local. Corporations and unions are prohibited from contributing in some states, and certain kinds of corporations, such as public utilities, gaming, and liquor licenses, and insurance companies may face special restrictions. Lawmakers have also proposed restrictions on contributions made by donors residing outside a candidate's state. 
So, you know, there's a there's a section here about why it matters and uh, and free speech. And one of one of the things and this is uh, one of the things is participating in fair and open election is one of the many freedoms that Americans enjoy. And the First Amendment ensures that your right of free, free speech and it is an expression of this right to contribute directly to a candidate's campaign or to make an online video or TV advertisement in support or opposition to a candidate. In addition to voting, this is how you make your voice heard. And government is always going to have an important uh, position of power. So free speech in the form of support or opposition to elected officials serve as an important check on that power. Free and fair elections should maximize people's ability to run and participate and support candidates. And setting strict limitations and regulations on campaign financing can swelch that participation. There's, Meg, I'd love for us to talk a little bit about you know, uh, just this expression of free speech. And also, you know, there's a lot of concern about around some argue that large contributions make politicians rely on wealthy individuals or corporations or unions. Um, so they then answer to these donors and contributors instead of the average voters. What are your thoughts on just having spent your career in political fundraising? What, you know, what are your thoughts around around this and, and why it matters and, uh, and and why it's an expression of of people's really free speech? Sure. So my experience um, was formative in that I worked for um, members of Congress as a consultant and I would help them raise money. And, and my experience is really formed by that. I just think that there is a perception that, you know, elected officials could be bought by a contribution. And I just would say that's just not my experience, that elected officials are motivated by um, really honestly believing they want to do what's right for this country. So this notion that elected officials can be bought off, yes, are there, I think just like America, elected officials are representative of the country. There are far more good people than bad people, far more smart people than not smart people. And I think most politicians, this idea that they could be bought off or unduly influenced is just inaccurate that ultimately um, a politician is guided by a set of principles and those principles can come from many places, right? Ideology, uh, world experience. Um, maybe they have deeply held religious views that motivate how they, how they vote uh, or how they, they think about the world. And I think that this idea that they can be motivated by a campaign check of $1,000 is just not necessarily accurate. So, you know, my experience is really formed from having worked with elected officials that ultimately the support comes because the elected official is supportive of someone's industry or someone's com or or someone's interest, and that they're they're motivated to they're they're doing the right thing. And so the the donor is acting out of a free speech, saying thank you for your help, thank you for your support, thank you for advocating for principles that I believe in, and then they're providing support. Yeah, and and also I think like when you make a campaign contribution, you feel more invested in this campaign and feel like I'm going to follow what this candidate, what were mm -hmm. his or her promises during a campaign, and what are they actually doing, and then mm -hmm. I'm kind of part of that fan base. There's in the brief, you know, there's there's a lot of money spent in political ad, and uh, I think it's in the order of like ten billion dollars in mm -hmm. 2020 already in in political ad, and then there's also a graph here around uh, that very few Americans actually donate to political campaigns, although the impact is still really large. So there's a tiny group of 0.47 percent um, that deliver. 71% of the total contribution to political campaigns. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in 2020, uh, there are 44% of contributions to federal campaigns were actually made by women. And this is the highest, uh, the highest of, of all the years. I think in the 90s, it was at 20%. So that is really to watch at the end of this election cycle where, where it will be. Um, what, one of the things I would like to mention is once an individual has raised or spent more than $5,000, uh, he or she must register with the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, as a candidate and transfer funds into a campaign account whose funds will be disclosed. And the FEC provides 
kind of easy to navigate definitions for election related uh, organizations. So what we'll do now, we'll walk through what are these different uh, election related organizations. And Meg, if you could talk about the uh, political action committee, a PAC, uh, what it is and how it functions. Sure. So a PAC or a political action committee are committees that are established and administered by corporations, labor unions, membership organizations, or trade associations. As such, they spend money on elections and can donate money to parties or candidates, but are not party affiliated or an authorized committee of a candidate. PACs that are established, administered, or financially supported by a private sector company or labor organization are called separate segregated funds, or SSF. They are funded by the organization with which they are associated and can only receive contributions from individuals connected to these groups, such as those who work for or own shares in the corporation. Uh, Open Secrets, which is a great resource, keeps track of the top corporate PAC contri contributors. PACs without such a corporate or labor sponsor are called non-connected PACs. They are financially independent and are allowed to solicit funds from the public. So, you know, anyone can really start a PAC, right? A group of people who are, who have a belief in, in one issue uh, can start a PAC. What's your experience with, uh, with, with PACs? Sure. So that was my first job was raising money from political action committees for can, uh, candidates. So I worked for a, a campaign would hire us to be a consultant to hire to to raise money from political action committees. So, you know, from my and now I, I run a PAC right now. I run the, the Rock Holdings Inc. PAC. It's a PAC that's affiliated with with Quicken Loans and the Rocket family of companies. So I have a lot of experience doing it. I raised PAC money when I was at the NRCC. And what I would say is that, you know, Every, almost every um, corporation has a PAC. And again, it's it's not corporate money being put into a fund to be given to a camp, given to a campaign. It's employees of a company are pool their money, put their money subject to contribution limits. The maximum an individual can contribute to a PAC. It's five thousand dollars per calendar year. So and, and it's also regulated who exactly can give to a PAC. Not every employee can give to a company's PAC. It's restricted. Uh, it has to be a part of the company's restricted class, and that's the the Federal Election Commission sets those standards. So, um, you know, a, a an employee in the restricted class can contribute up to five thousand dollars to the PAC, and then that money is pooled and then given out, also subject to contribution limits, to candidates and campaigns. So, a, a corporate or a union PAC can give up to ten thousand dollars per. Uh, or excuse me, $5,000 per election cycle to a candidate. So candidates have a primary and a general. So that's $10,000 over the course of a, a two-year congressional race or a six-year Senate race. And then they can also give $5,000 to other PACs. So for example, um, Rock Holdings PAC, uh, we give $5,000 to the Mortgage Bankers Association PAC because I work for a company that sells mortgages. So we are allowed to give money from our PAC to the Mortgage Bankers Association PAC. So yes, um, PACs have been around for a long time. Um, they're highly regulated. Every contribution is disclosed, both as a contribution to the PAC, as well as a disbursement out of the PAC. Um, and so it's, it's very transparent. And almost every company has a PAC. Almost every trade association has a PAC, every labor union. It's a really effective way for um, a business to to speak, we talked about free speech to go ahead and you know voice support for a candidate. We are providing the support to a candidate, or because we believe this candidate is good for our business. So it's a really important tool um, for companies who have government affairs operations to to advocate on their behalf. And it's also, I think, like for individuals. I have a friend who started like a Korean uh, path. Right. Yep. Anyone who has a real uh, yep. group of people with with uh, affinity or you know a, a yep. real issue that they uh, believe in is also um, you know invited to form a PAC or contribute to a PAC. So then you indicate to the candidate that your position is important. So there's a PAC about like moms and safe neighborhoods, for instance, is right. a PAC that was formed. So uh, and it's a lot easier to set up than I originally. Uh, thought yeah. It was, so. yeah, yes, absolutely. Anyone can set up a PAC. You just have to, you know, maybe hire, find an attorney or, you know, make sure that you're legally compliant with uh, any, all the regulations of the, the Federal Election Commission. 
So the other uh, organization, election-related organization, is an independent expenditure-only committee, and that's uh, a term that's used for super PACs. And super PACs, the difference is super PACs can solicit and spend unlimited sum of money, but they cannot contribute directly to a politician or a political party. And this is why they're also called independent expenditure-only committees. So independent expenditures are made for a communication that advocates for the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate, but is not coordinated with a candidate's a candidate's committee, a party committee, or their agents. So the super PACs are not legally considered political action committees and are regulated under different rules. So PACs can contribute directly to candidates and political parties, but super PACs cannot. They can just only run advocacy campaigns for the election of a candidate um, without any communication to the campaign. And I think the, the rules are very strict about that, right? Yes, so you absolutely. Like some, you've worked with super PACs, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And, yes, uh, I have. Yep. I, I haven't directly, but have certainly worked for organizations that cared about the activity of super PACs. So when I worked for the congressional committee, certainly, you know, we were very aware of the activity that a super PAC supporting Republican House candidates might take, because if they're spending money to advocate on behalf of a candidate, that might affect the outcome of the race. So we certainly paid attention to it. Certainly in my role now, um, certainly, you know, our we are solicited to ask for support of super PACs. Um, and certainly it's something that's in the news a lot um, that, that voters want to hear about, that campaigns talk about. So, um, and I know we'll get to it later in the brief, but you know, it, it's pretty recent that super PACs have been able to, to have this activity. It was a Supreme Court decision in 2010 that kind of laid the groundwork for us to, to find ourselves where we are now. Oh, with the super PACs and super yes. PACs. Spending yeah. which is really unlimited on on ads campaign for or against a candidate or on an issue. Uh, so the other uh, election related organization are the 527s. So Meg, do you want to take that section on the 527s? Sure. So 527s are tax exempt groups that are organized under Section 527 of the Internal Revenue Code to raise money for political activities. 527 organizations are most commonly used as tools for issue advocacy or to drive voter turnout, and they're prohibited from expressly advocating for an election of a specific candidate. They can raise unlimited funds from individuals, labor unions, and corporations, but they must reg register with the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, and disclose contributions and expenditures. Registering with and abiding by IRS guidelines, but not organizing as a PAC with the FDC makes this structure unique among the other political organizations. Uh, so the 527 are really organization that kind of build the infrastructure of a party. Mm -hmm. So they may be the organization that house campaign schools or that groom or candidates, uh, recruit candidates that are affiliated with a political party, or they also may advocate for an issue or have re voting, get out the vote initiatives or uh, even voter registration initiatives, I think might also happen under 527s. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also the 501C organization. So the 501C is an IRS designation in the tax code that's for most nonprofit groups. And the 501Cs account for a very small slice of political spending, only 3% in 16, but are often involved with policy research and advocacy with, uh, which often inform candidates' position on policy issues. So there's the C3 in uh, organizations. Those are charitable organizations that are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or intervening any political campaign. So that's based on the IRS code. Then there's the 501C4 organizations, which are, are categorized as social welfare organizations. And they may engage in some political activities as long as they spend less than 50% of their money on politics. So the C4's organizations are unique because they can engage in political spending, but are not required to disclose donors. So that means they can do some advocacy for 
for an issue specific, but they also need to have an education or a nonprofit form. So one good example I would say is kind of the League of Women Voters always has a has a big C4 where they use a portion of their funds to provide some civics education, organized debates, uh, education in, in schools, but then they also have an advocacy fund where they really uh, do some ads and spend their funds to advocate for local and even national issues. Uh, that impact an election, may impact a ballot initiative, may impact, impact a legislation. Uh, then there's the C5 organizations, which are labor unions, and C6 organizations, which are trade associations, such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, and both operate similarly to a C4 organization. So there's really detailed guidelines on how to navigate this line of political and non-political uh, activity. And one thing that I've learned is whenever you are giving or participating in, in the activities of a, a nonprofit organization and share any kind of nonprofits, it's really great to look at what is their C4 component, what kind of advocacy are they doing, and at which level of government, because that means that the money that you give to that organization is going to some political activity in some capacity. So, uh, Megan, do you have like some comments around the the C3s and maybe some of your experience there and how um, they function or how you know you've been able to work with them? Sure. So, um, I've had quite a bit of experience working with them, and it really is important to understand the differences between them because, to your point. You know, you can give money to an organization and you as the donor should have some certainty around how the money is going to be spent. So certainly a C3 is kind of how you'd interact with the foundation. So a lot of um, policy research are going to be C3s. And certainly from my experience, that's how I've interacted with them when we have needed some policy research or uh, we wanted to support efforts in that vein. We have supported C3s. C4s do have that split that, um, you know, 50, you know, less than 50% can be spent on political activity. The remaining needs to be spent not in advocacy work. So that's certainly, you know, a very important distinction. And then, you know, obviously trade associations and labor unions are really important, um, really important organizations in, in advocate, you know, as they advocate for business or, or labor or whatever, um, organization they're working for. And I would say when you're looking at campaign finance, in particular, this discussion, all these pieces fit together, right? A lot of times a C3 might have an affiliated C4, which might have a connection to a trade association. So these pieces all kind of fit in the puzzle to be able to comply with whatever the, the applicable campaign finance laws are to achieve the goals of an organization, right? Like that's why you have a lot of them in tandem. Um, and I think you'll see that as we continue going through this brief, talking about how kind of the, the party system is interconnected. Um, it, it allows, you know, different uh, parts of the law, you know, different entities under certain parts of the law will take certain actions. And so uh, I think that's really what you see with the three, the C3, the C4, and the C5 organization. Yeah. And it's it's also, you know, if you are part of a trade association, this is also where you can really get engaged with your association is looking at what's their advocacy effort, what is their C4 effort, and um, and then really start to understand where they are influencing uh, legislation and policymaking in, in your community and your state or even the nation. So let's talk a little bit about the role of government. And Megan, if you could take the federal section, I'll take the state. Sure. So the Federal Election Commission, or the FEC, oversees federal election. It's an independent regulatory agency that administers and enforces federal campaign finance law. And that means it has jurisdiction over the U.S. House, the Senate, the presidential, and vice presidential campaign finance. Federal campaign finance laws focuses on, uh, they focus on public financing of presidential campaigns, public disclosure of funds raised and contributed to federal candidates, and limits on such contributions and expenditures. So in the states, the states, they set their own campaign finance laws, but they must also comply with federal law. So for example, some state level laws are set in the state constitution or created through ballot measures, while others borrow from the federal government's guidelines and are still others create their own approach and experiment from there. 
So the states must also comply with federal Supreme Court decisions, as well as court decisions from their local circuit or state. And federal and appeals court precedent applies to all elections, but outside of those rulings, states are able to create their own laws. So for example, some states allow corporate contributions to state elections, while such contributions are prohibited in federal elections. And all states have a governing body for campaigns that oversees state and local elections, either through a state board of election, its office of the secretary of state, an ethics commission, or another campaign finance type regulatory body. The National the Conference of State Legislators has broken down election laws and campaign contributions limit and Ballotpedia compares campaign finance laws across the states. Those are like two great resources to understand your state laws, the limits, and, and you really need to be knowledgeable when you are making contributions uh, at various level. So Meg, you know, the, the federal, as stated here, you know, the, the federal government oversees federal campaigns, presidential, vice presidential campaign finance, and then the state is more focused on the state. So you have like some other experience dealing with that or understanding kind of the difference and maybe some of the challenges that you've dealt with? Sure. So it's what I've been working on a lot in the last year in, in my job. You know, I, you know, rocket companies, uh, we are a mortgage company that lends in all 50 states. So we have a desire to to be engaged and support candidates in all in not all the states, but many of them. So it is, um, you know, the campaign finance laws in the state of Michigan are different from Ohio, which is different from Texas, which is, you know, and all of those are different from the federal government. And I would say even within a state, you know, your local, if you want to support your city council member, the, the laws around how much you can give that individual and when you can give that money might be different from what you can give um, a state elected official. So there's lot, the, the rules vary by state and then they also vary by office within the state. So it's something that certainly, definitely your Secretary of State's website is really the, the perfect resource for understanding what the rules are in your state. So I would start there if, if anyone is interested, if you know, if you want to engage in political activity in your state. Um, and the FEC is also a great resource, but yes, there's a lot of difference um, and it varies by locality and by state. And uh, there's a lot of there's quite a bit of legislation also around uh, financing campaign campaign finance. Um, so money has always been part of the American political process. So, for example, I think here in the brief, there is in the 19th century even gubernatorial campaigns in Kentucky solicited contributions ranging from five thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, which is amounts to about $270,000 today. And even in 1896, William McKinley is said to have raised and spent between six to $7 million, which is $180 million today. So this is not new. And you know, 100 years later in, in 96, labor unions contributed over $40 million directly to political campaigns. And in 16, the total labor sector for political contributions was of $217 million in races nationwide. So that was on the open secret. So there's definitely, uh, you know, campaign contributions are, have always existed. So there's been a lot of legislation around it. And the first legislation was in 1867, the Na Naval Appropriations Bills, which prohibited officers and employees of the federal government from soliciting money for political campaigns from naval yard workers. And in the 1900s, allegations that corporation had exerted outsized influence on prior presidential elections prompted the passage of the Tillman Act in 1907. And then after Congress enacted several more pieces of legislation, including a 1910 Federal Corrupt Practice Act, 1939 Hatch Act, 1947 Taft Hartley Act, all of which established campaign finance limitations and regulations. And then these multiple laws were very difficult to enforce because there was not one single framework. So Congress passed the federal 
Election Campaign Act in 1971 to replace the existing patchwork laws. And then Congress amended the act in 74 to set more limitations on spending and contributions and to establish the Federal Election Commission, which is an independent agency that really oversees campaign finance. So in the 1990s, there were several like perceived loopholes in the 1974 act, which prompted further reform and in Congress enacted in 2002, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which is also called the McCain-Feingold Act to address issue of advocacy. This is the advertisement that praised or criticized a federal candidate, but did not explicitly call for election or defeat of a candidate. And soft money, which are funds generally perceived to influence elections, but not regulated by campaign finance laws. So, Megan, in your role, I'm sure you've seen, you've spent your career in fundraising. So this change in legislation, you know, I'm sure has had an impact as to how you fundraise and how you make contributions to campaigns. So you have some experience to share here? Sure. So I, um, I started my career in uh, 2007. So the, the most recent um, change would have been the, the bipartisan, the McCain Feingold Act, which, you know, would have been, you know, five years after the fact. And so a lot of the folks I was working with at the time I was my, in my first job would, would talk about the time before the McCain-Feingold Act, how different it was, how the good old days when, you know, you could, you could raise soft money for party committees, and they were very critical of it because, you know, certainly on, on the right side of the ledger, I think folks thought it, um, it went a little too far and that maybe it had some unattended consequences of, of empowering entities on the outside to have a larger say in uh, in in what was going on more so than the parties. So my experience was mostly hearing about the days prior to McCain-Feingold and how different it was. So I haven't known any other career. Um, so outside of uh, you know, or excuse me, I haven't known a career prior to McCain-Feingold. Yeah, it feels like people are still talking about it, even yeah. though it's really a long time ago. But it feels. Yeah. Like because I, I think it was so, um, it made such a big change, you know, that I think the biggest thing that, that, that folks would talk about is how the party committees could no longer raise and use soft money for party building activities. Right. And how that really took a lot of the, and, and before McCain-Feingold, the party committees, so the DNC and the RNC, were able to play a much larger role in in election activities because they could raise more money and, and, and disperse it um, in ways that they're no longer allowed to now. Yeah, interesting. So there has been, so in the brief, uh, the brief outlined several significant court cases uh, that the Supreme Court has worked to balance concerns about corruption in campaign finance without infringing too broadly on First Amendment rights. The Supreme Court has consistently held that restrictions on political speech must serve the state's interest in fighting corruption or in reducing the appearance of corruption. This measure is often utilized to prove corrupt quid pro quo uh, exchanges. So there's a strict scrutiny is the guide used by the Supreme Court when it comes to balancing campaign finance restrictions and freedom of speech rights. Strict scrutiny is the most rigorous form of judicial review. Once a court determines that strict scrutiny must be applied, it is presumed that the law and policy is unconstitutional. The government has the burden of proving that its challenged policy is constitutional to withstand strict scrutiny. The government must show that its policy is necessary to achieve a compelling state interest. If this is proved, the state must then demonstrate that the legislation is narrowly tailored to achieve the intended result. So the brief goes through like several, and maybe what we could do is highlight some of these cases. Uh, in 1976, the Buckley versus Vallejo case, uh, essentially ruled that political campaign spending limits violated the First Amendment. And according to the decision, limits on campaign contribution serve the government's interest in safeguarding the integrity of the elections, but spending limits restrict the quantity of campaign speech by individual, 
group and candidates. So the court uh, let stand a federal $1,000 tied to the inflation, today's $2,700 candidate contribution limit per individual donor per election. But the Supreme Court and at least one state court have overturned contribution limits that were set so low that they impeded free speech and association. So I thought that was, to me, that was it's really interesting that campaign contribution is really tied to, to free speech. And, uh, and that's what is being held by the Supreme Court. And, and to me, that there was a, it's like surprising this section on, on just all of these cases. Uh, and there's continuously, I think, some challenges to the campaign finance laws. So I don't know if you have like some things to share on, on that just in general. Sure. So kind of maybe answering your question that you asked earlier about which laws, you know, affected me most or did I, did, you know, uh, maybe what I would like to say is that the the court ruling that had the most impact for me in my career was actually the McCutcheon ruling. So the McCutcheon versus FEC ruling, which came out in 2014. And, it, uh, and I actually met the Mr. McCutcheon. We were at a dinner together. So I got to talk to him about why he brought this case forward. And he was a very fascinating individual. You know, he wanted to contribute to, I think he wanted to contribute to every Republican candidate running for federal office. And at the time that was prohibited, there was what was called a biennial limit, an aggregate limit, meaning over the course of a two year election cycle, he could only contribute, um, I think it was like $126,000. Well, if the limit is you know, around 2,700, you can't do that under the law. And so he challenged it uh, and his case got to the Supreme Court and he won. And that uh, ruling was uh, huge, was a big, it had a big impact on my career because at the time I was at a party committee and we often were challenged by, we would like to, we want to raise money from donors, but they would be caught by this limit, meaning the donor had already reached their two-year limit. Even if they were always contributing within the donor limits, meaning contributing no more than 2,700, or at that time, it was a little bit of a lower uh, donor limit, but they could only contribute to certain amount overall. They had reached their limit. So that actually was a really important ruling and that the court found that it it restricted his Mr. McCutcheon's free speech that he that, that the law was limiting that he his it was his free speech right to say I want to give to every Republican running for Congress and so um, that was a, a ruling that you know directly impacted my career it was interesting to meet the the gentleman who brought the case um, because he you know he took it all the way to the Supreme Court and he won which is just, a, it was a fascinating experience. Fascinating, fascinating. There was, uh, the other one that's outlined here is the Citizens United mm -hmm. versus the FEC in 2010. And this is a nonprofit group called Citizens United who wanted to air a movie during the final weeks before the 2008 Democratic primary election. However, the regulations set by the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act banned the broadcast, cable, or satellite transmission of electioneering communications paid by corporations or labor unions from their general funds in 30 days before a presidential primary and in 60 days before the general election. And the Supreme Court heard the case and struck down the restrictions on political spending by corporations, and that includes nonprofit corporations and unions. And the Supreme Court determined that across the board bans on corporate or union expenditures are unconstitutional. And the court did maintain, however, sponsor disclosure requirements and a restriction on direct contributions to candidates by corporations. Uh, the federal ban on contributions or expenditures by foreign nationals also remained the law. But I thought that was that was kind of uh, that was really interesting that there were such limits and that people are really challenging those. And I think it happens across the board, even in state laws are continuously mm -hmm. being challenged and, and redefined. Um, there's actually a Khan Academy video uh, that details cut campaign finance and the Citizens United case. People are interested in watching that. Yeah, this is certainly the newsiest one when I think folks who, who know very little about campaign finance have certainly heard about Citizens United because it's something that 
um, you know, was in 2010, but it's continued to have a big impact on our elections. And it's certainly something one talk about a lot. So there's also here a uh, mention of the Janus versus Axme uh, ruling, uh, which is uh, the American Je uh, Janus versus the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And the Supreme Court ruled that public sector unions cannot require non-member employees to pay agency fees covering the cost of non-political union activities. And in 2017, unions represented about 40% of the public sector workers, almost 8 million workers. And this level of membership gives public sector unions considerable political influence at the local, state, and federal levels. And this decision supported the argument that requiring members to pay agency fees violated free speech rights and was akin to compelling them to give financial support to an organization whose political activities they might not support. So this is also a big issue where unions are supporting, as we stated earlier, political campaigns. They are one of the eight top 10, um, the top eight contributors to, to political campaigns are labor unions and they don't necessarily always represent the political views of their, of their members, which is kind of the, the big issue. So um, there's a section here on contributing to campaigns. So uh, Megan, do you wanna take the section on limits and regulations? You talked a little bit about that already. So maybe you could take this section. Sure. So you may contribute as much money as you like to 501c3s, fours, fives, or sixes, or a super PAC, which conducts independent expenditures. By law, there are no limits on independent expenditures or contributions to groups that only make independent expenditures. But if you're contributing directly to a candidate, to a political party, or to a PAC, there are limits on the amount you can contribute. At the federal level, the FEC sets the limits. For state elections, the limits vary by state. In one state-to-state -state comparison, Alabama, for example, allows for unlimited contributions from individuals in state Senate races, state House races, and governor's races. Alternatively, Wisconsin limits, limits the contribution from an individual to $20,000 for a statewide race, $2,000 for a state Senate race, and $1,000 for a state assembly race. Yeah, so the limits are, are very clear and it's always a good idea to really understand what are the limits in, in your state. There's also the issue of uh, disclosing donors so the Institute for Free Speech outlines all spending calling for the election or defeat of candidates requires some type of disclosure. And there is more disclosure today than in any previous time in US history. The FEC requires the entity paying for an ad to be named in broadcast and cable political advertising, as well as in print ads. Candidates, political parties, PACs and super PACs at the federal level and in 49 states must disclose their expenditures, income, and donors. And there's an open secret summary of disclosure rules per organization. I think also now the, the web platforms are also putting in their own um, rules of disclosing who pays for uh, web-based for social media ads as well, which is not mentioned here, but that's also something that is at play, right? Yes, absolutely. I think you've seen more and more campaigns spend their money online to reach donors. And so whether that's Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, that's where a lot of political ad spending is migrating. And yes, disclosure is an important part of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in most situations, when you donate money, you're required to disclose your name, to whom you donated, your address, your occupation, and your employer. And that information is held in a public database, and other members of the public, including journalists, may access it. If you contribute to a federal candidate, super PAC, PAC, or to a political party organization, like the RNC or the DNC, donations over $200 are disclosed. This threshold at the state level varies from $20 to $300. C3 and C4 organizations are not required to publicly disclose donor information. As noted above, a C3 is precluded from doing most political 
activity, and a C4 can only spend 50% of its resources on political activities. 527 organizations are not subject to FEC reporting requirements, but they are subject to IRS reporting. So there's currently a debate as to whether or not nonprofit organizations should be required to disclose donors on their spending. Some argue that there's a lack of transparency, serves special interests and contributes to corruption. Others say, well, disclosure requirements could hurt free expression by discouraging participation and donation. When people give to nonprofit organization, they're not in control of what the organization does. People give because they like some aspects of the organization mission, but they're not liable for the organization's every spending decision. So it's a good idea to kind of search the FEC database for record of contribution and to cross check that with a site like CQ Money Online to identify any donations like those to 527 organizations that weren't subject to the FEC. And then Open Secret also has a donor lookup site. So, um, so do you have like some advice in terms of like for entrepreneurs, business owners in terms of uh, their contributions and what are kind of some guidelines or some things to keep in mind? Sure. So I, I think first, um, you know, understanding uh, who you're giving to and so who, uh, what laws that entity is going to be subject to. So if it's a member of Congress you'd like to support, you know, understanding what the limits are for the federal via the Federal Election Commission. Uh, if you're giving to a local elected official, using the Secretary of State's website to, to access that information so you're compliant with the law. Um, and just, you know, have be eyes wide open about disclosure. If you are uncomfortable with being disclosed as a donor, then you might not be able to make that contribution. So having, you know, that awareness ahead of time uh, will make you, uh, you know, a, a better donor, a more informed donor. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And in the brief, we, um, the Policy Circle outlines here several uh, thought leaders and resources that you could use. Ballotpedia is actually a really great resource where it also lists all of the major contributors to a to a candidate. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's really uh, helpful to really understand who supports the candidate that, that you are looking at, that you are running in your community. And, and also it's a good idea too, there's several ways that you can get engaged, you know, contributing to a campaign is really helping, um, is making your voice heard and, uh, and also building a relationship and commitment to a candidate. So it's not something to look at negatively. And when a candidate calls you actually, and it takes a lot of courage, I have to say, uh, <laughs> it's really great to engage in a conversation with that candidates to fully understand where where they stand, what they do, and and why you know how they will be using your contribution to um, to really get their message out and their campaign um, uh, out you know up and and on a winning path. So you know those are some of the advice. So thank you so much, Megan, for uh, participating in uh, in this brief on campaign finance. It's really useful. And, you know, when in conclusion, campaign finance, we think happens only in election year, but it's actually every year there always seems to be an election, but there's also a lot of advocacy effort that occurs throughout the year. So it's not something that ends on election day. It's something that continues that you need to really be aware of, right? Absolutely. Yes, there is, you know, that certainly campaigns, you know, they, from day one, they start raising money or, you know, for folks, because they have a plan that they have to execute on. Um, and certainly that's a way for, for you guys, for everyone to engage early on with a candidate, you know, giving early is, is certainly a great way to, to provide support and, and endorse the candidate who, who you want to support. So getting in early on that conversation is certainly a, a valuable, a valuable thing to do. Yeah. So um, more to come. So thank you again. Thank you again, and thank you everyone for listening. I encourage you to actually go to the policycircle.org, start a circle. If you are not a circle, if you do not, if you're not part of a circle yet, and uh, and also convene people in your community to discuss campaign finance and research 
what is happening in uh, in your community in terms of PACs, in terms of super PACs and, and the campaigns, the candidates in your community, what is the status of their campaign finance? Those are really valid questions to ask and, and engage in. It just makes you part of being an informed voter and it's part of being an engaged citizen and an engaged uh, company in your community. So thank you again for joining me on this Civic Leader Podcast. So thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much.